right from the heart because it affects the heart. And tonight, what I'd like to talk to us about is something that has affected me personally, not just in years gone by, but even recently. And these are things that sometimes we don't fully understand. And so I'd like, with the Lord's help, to preach to you on a very sub- serious and a sensitive subject that uh, I hope that by the time we're done may give somebody some solace, some encouragement to go on and to continue to fight. If you tried to use a square machine tonight, I apologize. Every, maybe once every six months to a year, it'll sign itself out just as a security measure. And uh, I don't have the information with me to put it logged back in, maybe by the end of the service. So if you'd like to give in the machine, if you'll just get with me after service, I'll have more time. But right now, I've got to obey the Lord and make sure that I'm preaching God's Word, and the Lord will take care of that after the service. Again, continue to pray for my daughter, my family, and uh, lifting up the Lord in, in our life every day. All right? Genesis chapter number 39, we're going to start with verse number 19, Genesis 39 and verse 19. Is there anybody here tonight that says, Lord, if I don't shout, if I don't run, if I don't speak in tongues, if you'll just speak to me, if you'll just talk to me tonight, it'll be all right. Anybody need the Lord to talk to him tonight? I feel like God's going to do that tonight in this service. Even those may be watching online, God bless you. As I say all the time, share the video or audio. Sometimes when we have bad weather like we've had today and yesterday, uh, we'll get kicked out of the broadcast. If you're ever watching a broadcast, any of you, maybe at home or what have you, you can always log into our Spreaker account for the audio version. That rarely goes out. That's something that usually Uh, doesn't use a lot of bandwidth, and we usually don't have problems with that. Genesis chapter 39, verse number 19. How many is praying the Lord to help me tonight? Most of you know I've had to try and readjust my style and what I do in this pulpit, but I'm going to obey God no matter what, and and the Lord's going to have his way. Here's what the Bible says, and starting with verse number 19. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which he spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. He was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. Now, this is what I account for at least the second time during the process of what Joseph went through that we read the Bible saying specifically, but the Lord was with Joseph. The Bible said, showed him mercy, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison Whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. Then the verse number 23 says, The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. With the Lord's help tonight, like I said, I want to talk to you about a very serious subject. I'd like to preach for a while tonight on the unfair prison sentence, the unfair prison sentence. Will you raise your hand to the Lord and ask for God's will and way tonight? Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your word. We know that it is by your word that we have our daily bread, the substance by which we better understand your perfect will for our lives, not just in the past but in the future and even right now. I pray tonight, God, for the next few moments that you'll use the words that I speak to become power and life to the hearer, and you'll use the words that are spoken today to bring someone to the surface, someone that is drowning tonight. God, let them come up for air, and let them have reason to keep fighting and to go on and to leave this service with better understanding 
than they walk through the doors of this church with. And we will give you praise for the anointing that is poured out and is given in this service. And everyone can say amen. Most of us tonight are familiar with the story of Joseph. But I want us to be able to keep the story, the text that we're giving you tonight in context. I know sometimes when we know a story thoroughly that sometimes when the preacher goes through all the details, sometimes we get lost in the shuffle and the boredom of hearing the same words that we've heard before. But I feel it necessary tonight to make sure that we don't lose the continuity of the text and walk away from what preceded what Joseph went through and brought him to the place that he was in tonight. So those of you that don't know the story of Joseph, we're going to go to school for just a little while and better understand what took place in his life by looking at some of the highlights of this story. Some of you may have heard the name Joseph before. And as it's been mentioned, sometimes there are names within the Bible that we may read of. And we read that name again and find out later that it was not the same person in the Old Testament that it may have been in the New Testament. Some of you know Joseph as being the one that was the father, if you will, an earthly father figure to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, we have a different Joseph, and he is known sometimes as the Joseph, Joseph of Genesis. We look at these highlights of this story. I want you to first understand that Joseph, in this text, he is the favored son of his father, Jacob. How many have you ever heard the term used, the father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, Jacob was the father of this man that we read of named Joseph. This favor caused his father to give him the well-famous coat that we have heard of many times and read of, even in the King James Version, puts it as the coat that is of many colors. How many have ever heard of that story before? But this is that same Joseph the one that has favor from his father. His father loved him so much that he gave him that coat of many colors. I heard some time back one preacher put it like this. If we were to modernize the story and look at it from our everyday language today, if you would have been one of the many brothers that Joseph had, it would have been like on Christmas morning, everyone begins to open up their Christmas gifts. And you get an etch-a-sketch and so does all of your brothers. But Joseph gets an iPad. That would have been the way that it would have probably felt in their terminology and in their day. And so that favor that Joseph had from his father Jacob, it began to cause an envy and a strife within the household. But you see, there was a reason why that Jacob had a certain level of favor towards his son. It was because not only did Jacob know, but I believe that Joseph knew that the hand of God was purposely on the life of Joseph, that God had reached out and touched the life of Joseph because he had planned to use him years later down the road. You see, the Lord gives Joseph at one point in the story a dream, and in this dream, he begins to visualize or see himself as being a type of ruler. And his brothers, the ones that hated him and despised him, and those that denounced him, those same brothers in that dream, they were bowing down and so in some way giving homage unto their own brother as a ruler type figure. Well, Joseph messed around and I'll just put it this way in our everyday southern talk, messed around and, and told his brothers of this dream that he felt that God had given him. I don't know if it was the right thing to do, but apparently it was in the will of God that he did this. But when he'd done this and said this to his brothers, it only made them more envious towards him and hated him and despised him that he thought that somehow that not only was he the favored son and the favored brother, but now he's trying to tell them one day I'm going to rule over you. Now he wasn't, I don't believe, doing it in an arrogant sort of way, but in his youthful innocence at about 17 years old, he began to share with him what God has shown him. 
You know what I found by reading that? Is that sometimes God will do a great thing in our life. God will tell us he's about to do a big thing. And in so doing so to us and to our giving us a dream or a vision, sometimes we may tell somebody else that is envious to us. And if they have any way about it, they will do everything to destroy the dream that God gave you and to try to thwart the effort. What I'm telling you tonight is you don't go around telling everybody God's plans for your life because there's always somebody out there as sure as God's trying to do a big thing in your life you can understand that there's a devil there's a committee there's a pack of devils somewhere that would like nothing better than to destroy everything you stand for and would spit on the ground that you walk on especially if they can do it behind your back has anybody ever found that to be true But this was the life of Joseph. And he's told his brother this. And now he has not only told him his dream, but he has deepened the disdain that they have for him. So then we read on in the story that his father one day sends out Joseph to check on his brothers. Why that Joseph was not out with his brothers, I don't really fully understand. Could it be that the favor of his father had him at home to taking care of the business of the household while that his brothers were out doing hard labor? I cannot answer that. But he sends his brother or his son out to check on his brothers. And when Joseph gets close or a little ways in eyesight of where these brothers are, they began to detest him, seeing him walking across the horizon, seeing that coat of many colors that he most likely wore that day, hating and despising that brother. They began to come up with a plan to take the very life of their own brother. Let me tell you, when and your family hates you so bad that they would contemplate murdering you, you can, you can understand that is a deep rooted hatred that they have towards you. Do you know that right now there are people that hate me? There are some of you that love me and think, I think you're a great man of God. I think the world of you, Brother Myers. But as sure as you love me, there's somebody out there that cannot stand me. But I'm alright with that because as long as the Lord loves me and as long as God's got my back and I know where I stand with God what does it matter what everybody else thinks can you say amen somebody but those brothers contemplate murdering their own brother Joseph and then they began to come to the conclusion one brother's not completely on board with the plan and so they sell their brother to a traveling pack of merchants and when they sell their brother to that traveling pack of merchants he ends up in a pit where that they leave him basically to his own will in other words we don't care about you anymore we don't care whether you live or you die and so they sold their brother out out to some merchants and they ripped that coat off of him it was a symbol of their hatred when they snatched that coat off because that's the very thing that we despise you for the favor that our dad has towards you and now we're going to take the very thing that separated you from you and when they took that coat from him they took some animal blood and they put it on that coat they brought it brought it back to their father Jacob and they came up with a concocted story that a wild animal had killed their brother taking his life and Jacob as you can imagine Jacob wept sorely over the idea that his son was dead he didn't know what else to do can you imagine being that father knowing you've got a promised son and yet somehow by some freak of nature happenstance of nature that his life is taken from you well he believed what his sons had told him and went with the premise and the idea 
moaning and bemoaning the loss and the death of his son while yet his son lived on but was taken from the promised land and taken over to the land of Egypt. When he gets into Egypt, he begins to have the favor of God on his life to the degree. Everywhere Joseph went, you'll see the hand of God's right there with him. Even though that he had been sold out by his own brothers, even though that he was put in a pit, even though the coat that his own daddy gave him that meant so much to him, that royal coat of attire was snatched and ripped from him, even though that he's not with his daddy anymore. And now he knows possibly that his daddy doesn't have anything to do with him because he thinks he's dead. I'm not a 100% positive, but he's in a foreign land with foreign people. I don't know if he speaks their language well, but somehow in the midst of it all, God gave Joseph favor. Can you say thank God for favor? And with that favor, he begins to be elevated. He's not only part of the slaves, but he is made over the slaves. So he's still in slavery, but he's put over because of his leadership ability and the fact that the hand of God's on him. Well, it's not long that we see Joseph as time begins to progress, that we see Potiphar. You remember the name Potiphar in the story. Potiphar is the Pharaoh of Egypt in that land and day. He is his chief executioner. You remember that for what it's worth. Potiphar is the chief executioner underneath the Pharaoh of Egypt. And he sees one day the leadership ability of this slave master named Joseph. And he begins to watch him. And he gives him the opportunity to work directly underneath him in the palace. Now he's gone from slavery. He's no longer a slave, no longer a slave master. Now he's placed right within the ranks of of the ability to make executive decisions, if you will, underneath this man named Potiphar. So he works for a while under Potiphar. He gains ground. He gains a name and a reputation. But while he is there, you may, you may remember the name of this was woman, if you will, of Potiphar's wife. The Bible never gives her name, but refers to her as Potiphar's wife. Well, Potiphar's wife rose up with lust and infatuation towards him. I'm assuming that most likely if she had anything to do with the palace and royalty, that being in leadership like Potiphar was, that this woman was probably ideally a beautiful woman. And yet we see her lusting after this man from another country who is under the affairs of her husband. And she seduces him one day and tries tries to get him to be intimate with her. But her advances are thwarted whenever Joseph leaves his coat in her hand and runs off and flees from her. Can somebody thank God for a man with that much tenacity about him and faithfulness to God and faithfulness to the plan of God? You know, I began to think about the story and there are times of our life that we have had the enemy get in our ear and tell us you are well within reason. You've got justifiable reason to step outside of the boundaries of God's law and God's word and do this. Do you realize what you've been through? I can only imagine the devil getting in Joseph's ear and saying go ahead and give in to her advances. Uh, You're not married. You don't have a wife. She's a good looking woman. Uh, You've been through so much. You've been in prison. Your brother sold you out. You haven't seen your daddy in a long time. You've got everything every reason to do the wrong thing but even in the midst of it all he still stayed faithful to God and the plan of God for his life you began to read on in the story of Joseph I just needed to lay a little groundwork for you to see how that we get to this text but we read on and understand that whenever Potiphar realizes he's made Potiphar aware that she, she believes that, he, that Joseph has tried to rape her And so Potiphar steps in and he's got to do something. And so he is chief executioner. So easily 
He could have had him killed. Who knows how many ways. Do you know that in the Bible, if you were an executioner, especially a chief executioner, they come up, you read the history of execution. They, they made, they prided themselves on coming up with weird and unusual ways to murder and take the life of somebody. If you read history, you'll read where they took men and they would tie ropes to their feet and their hands and they would have a man on one side with a horse and another on the other side and they'd have the horse take off and rip a man in half. There were other times, uh, there's actually a message you can preach out of this where that they would take somebody that was living and strap a dead decomposing body to them and eventually that rottening body would begin to get worms and crawl into the other person's skin and the smell and the stench was meant to be a type of torture. So these chief executioner men, uh, they had all, all the mind, if you will, to commit any kind of act, heinous act of murder to take the life of another person. But how many of you remember what the Bible said? When I read to you the text, it said here the, 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 this favor that God gave him, uh, it said, but the but Joseph's master took him, put him in prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. He was there in the prison. But the Bible said that Joseph was favored by God in the midst of it all. So in other words, even though he could have had his life taken, God said, I'm letting you go through this, but I'm not letting your life be taken because then the ultimate plan will be abandoned. Doesn't that sound like Job? How many of you remember that the Lord told the enemy Satan? He said, you can touch him in many different ways, so to speak, but you can't take his life. There are some of you tonight, you may be going through things or gone through things you didn't understand, and you wonder, how did I make it out? Well, I would submit to you tonight that there are times that God said to that person who is trying to deflate every plan of God for your life, you can come against his health. You can come against his finances, but I'm not going to let you take his life. There are even times that our life may be lost, but God's plan will be done up to the moment that our body inhales and exhales for the very last time. Can you say amen? But when I read that story, we understand that God allowed him to go through this time in prison. Thirteen years is the approximate number that has been agreed upon by most everybody that Joseph spent in prison. Is there anybody besides me tonight that says that does not seem fair? He didn't do anything to anybody. He was trying to do the right thing, and yet he still got put in prison. Well, he didn't die, but he, hasn't, he doesn't have his brothers. He doesn't have his father, and yet he is put in prison. Doesn't seem fair. While he is in that prison, like all of the times of his life that we read of previous, favor is with him and because of that favor he begins to be elevated to the position of oversight over the prisoners in the prison God was setting him up for the ultimate plan that he had for his life 13 years in a prison can you imagine one day two men come into that prison one is a baker and the other man is a cupbearer that was kicked out of the king's palace, put in prison. A cupbearer and a baker. These two men at one point, they have a dream. Both of them do. And they don't know what that dream means. God is setting up the next stage and platform for God's ultimate plan for Joseph. Joseph gives the interpretation to those dreams. He tells the cupbearer, he said, in three days you'll be restored to the, to the palace of Pharaoh. When you do, when you get reestablished, remember me. Then he tells that baker, in three days from now, 
you will be executed and your life will be taken from you. I'm sure that the cupbearer loved the news and the baker abhorred the news. Both dream interpretations came to pass. The cupbearer was reinstated to the palace while the baker, his life was taken by execution. So we would think that shortly thereafter, somehow, that God would allow Joseph to come right out of prison. But that wasn't the case. The cupbearer went back and forgot all about Joseph. Some time went by. Some say it was a few years. Some say it was at least a year. But a little while goes by, and the next thing you know, Pharaoh, God's setting up the next stairway to the next plan for God to do something big in Joseph's life. At 17 years old, he received a dream that he shared with his brothers. Now, 17 plus 13 years later, here he is. Pharaoh's had a dream. Nobody seems to be able to know what the interpretation to the dream is. Pharaoh is so irritated about the whole thing that he's ready to start taking lives if somebody can't tell him the meaning of that dream. All of a sudden, it comes back to the recollection of the cupbearer that once had his dream interpreted by Joseph in a prison cell. He says, I know a man. I remember somebody. Do you know that I'm glad tonight that there are times that we think that we're all by ourselves. We think that nobody cares. But sometimes God will allow an inside man with an inside plan to get us back where we're supposed to be to fulfill the ultimate plan that God has for our life. Can you say thank God for those cup bearers that God puts in our life that may think that it's all about them, but God says it was all about my plan the whole time. So the cupbearer tells the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh goes and gets Joseph from prison, brings him back, and Joseph tells him the interpretation of the dream. When Pharaoh realizes just how mighty the hand of God is on his life, immediately Pharaoh realizes, and Pharaoh says, I'm going to put him in charge over all the affairs of this nation. There won't be but one superior over Joseph, and that would be me, Pharaoh. In other words, he was the associate, or he was the vice president of that land, given power and authority. And it was there that most of you know the rest of the story, that I can't be here all night long telling you a whole thing, but most of you that know the rest of the story, it put Joseph in prime position to fulfill the plan of God that one day when he had stored up that food in a time whenever there was a famine in the land and his brothers and his dad eventually come before him. Most of you know the story. But what I want us to focus in tonight on is not so much all the details of the story that I've told you tonight, but I want us to look at the fulfillment of the dream that he received at 17 years old, but in contrast, Contrast to the fact that he spent 13 years in a prison cell. I want you to consider just how unfair that that was to a man who was simply trying to do the will of God. A man that had tried to do everything right, but in spite of trying to do everything right, it seemed like everything was going wrong. If you've ever felt that way, wave your hand and let me know tonight. You see, I don't doubt probably that everybody here tonight has had at least one circumstance or situation that our own flesh, in our flesh, that we felt as though that God had allowed some unfair hand to be dealt to us. Have you ever been there before? I've been by the bedside of family that were in critical shape. I've gone through things myself and I thought, God, where are you? Have you ever felt that way before? Now, I don't understand this and it 
doesn't make a lot of sense. But I can tell you that when that happens to us, I'm going to tell you some of the things that we often do that the Holy Ghost reminded me of today while I sat in, a, in my truck in a parking garage near the hospital and the Holy Ghost began to talk to me. When we go through those seasons of our life that we cannot fully understand, we began to process the weight of it by looking at our own track record. The first thing we often do is look at our track record. God, I've been faithful. God, I have sacrificed. When I had extra money, I put it in that offering plate. I've tried to pay tithes when I had the money. God, I've been faithful to church when I could. I've done everything I know to do. God, I've been there for people who were never even there for me. I've forgiven people, God, that probably didn't even deserve to be forgiven. And this don't make sense. With the Lord's help, I want to talk to you today. You see, in respect to our own track record, it seems that God would lighten our load and maybe show us just a little bit more favor. You already know what I've got on me. You already know what's on my plate. You already know what I'm having to deal with. I can't imagine, Sister Linda, whenever you found out the first time that there was a spot in your brain and here you are trying to take care of Robert and Catherine and Olivia and Rose trying to be that, that pillar for many of your family, trying to help out the church every chance you get, trying to bear the load of everybody else's problems. And now this, have you ever been there before? If you've never been there, hang on, honey, it's coming. Somebody say amen. But I tell you, we began to look at our own track record and we think, God, it would make more sense right now if you just lighten the load a little bit. I've been there before myself. You see, when we go through those phases where we try uh, to spiritualize our afflictions to help ourselves cope, that don't last very long either. Have you ever tried to spiritualize your situation? Try to help yourself get through it? You say things to yourself like, well, God saves his hardest battles for his toughest Christians, his best saints. Yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Or we say things like, there's always somebody out there worse than me. And we do everything we can to spiritualize it so we can try to cope with it. But then we hit that bottom side and that spiritualizing it, trying to make it better, don't always last very long. Now, I might not be talking to everybody, but I know I'm talking to somebody because God put this on my heart because all of us have most likely been through that place. I tell you tonight, it ain't easy. Somebody can say amen to that if you agree. But you see, we try to spiritualize it by looking at all of this and we do this to ease the weight, hoping that if we can just ease the weight on the things we cannot understand, I can get through this. You ever done that? You ever looked at yourself going down the road in the rearview mirror, start talking to yourself? Or you're driving down the road, there's always somebody out there worse than me. And uh, you, you're talking to somebody and they're feeling sorry for you. I hate that you go, oh, no, you know, I'm just, I, I'm, God saves his toughest battles for his toughest saints. I must be one of the tough ones. Praise God. You want to try to encourage your own self. And I don't tell you, I'm not going to tell you tonight that's not a good thing to do. I'm not going to tell you that. But I will tell you, it's a roller coaster of emotions. It sure is. I don't care how spiritual you are, how long you've been preaching, but it's a roller coaster of emotions, things you don't understand. If you've never had to look death in the eye, if you've never had to see someone that you had confidence would be with you to the very end walk out on you, then you wouldn't understand what I'm preaching tonight. If you've never been through situations in your life that didn't leave you riding down the road or laying in the bed wondering what it would be like if you just took your own life, then maybe you don't know what I'm talking about tonight. But there are some people that know exactly what I mean tonight because it feels like an unfair prison sentence on you. Why? I don't deserve this. I've tried to do as good to others and be good to people. And then, if that's not enough, you have those moments in your life where you 
where the reality of what you're actually going through hits you square in the face. The moment that you look out the front door and the truck's hooked up to the back of your car and they're repossessing it, or the moment you get a phone call and they say, we need you out by the 13th. Come on now. When reality hits you square in the face after you try to spiritualize and try to get through it, and all of a sudden the enemy comes right towards you and then you start talking crazy. Oh, I know. I've done it. We usually don't do that in a public place. And we don't always do that when we're at church. Sometimes we do that to the people closest to us. God help our husbands and wives and our families. When they're trying to go to sleep and you're crying the blues, woe is me. Let me tell you what you do when you ride this roller coaster. Now this ain't going to sound spiritual. You start saying things like, you know, if God really loved me, he'd see how bad I was struggling. So it must be, must be something wrong with me. I must have done something wrong. Now, if I'm not talking to you, then maybe this don't apply, but I know a lot of folks have been here. Or you might say something like, I can't imagine myself allowing my own children to go through the same thing. I, I wouldn't do this to my own kids. I've had my, some of my own family relay that to me. I've thought that same thing before. If you ain't never thought that, God bless your heart. God, I don't understand. This does not make sense. You say, Pastor, I've never been through any struggle like that. Well, I hope you never do. Because if you ever do, you'll probably remember the night that you thought I was crazy for preaching this. And you think, that pastor knew exactly what he was talking about. You start talking to yourself. Uh, maybe I deserve it. I must be a horrible person. Maybe I deserve this. Maybe I've just done a lot of people wrong and I just didn't realize it. And then there's that other aspect of this emotional roller coaster that I call the Holy Ghost gave this to me today. Those silent thoughts. These are the thoughts you don't always share with everybody. Sometimes nobody. Because some of these thoughts, you know they're not right, yet they still walk through the corridors of your mind in the hardest, deepest part of your trial. When you start saying things to yourself like, or thoughts run through your mind, what if God isn't real? Or in your mind, the enemy starts trying to jump on your shoulder. How can he be a provider? And you're still going without. He deserved it because he disobeyed and stepped out of the will of God. Judas sold the Lord for just a little bit of money and served the punishment that could have been handed down because he did that. Nobody else. He couldn't blame nobody. But Joseph is a man that has been trying to do right. I don't read anywhere where he's done anybody wrong. And he's been dealt an honor. Is that it may be hard for us to comprehend the process. The process is that place that God uses or that thing that God uses for the perfection of his will in our life. You see, the process from the time, I, I'm just going to put it this way. When it gets painful, it's unfair. Or, or when it becomes, can do that. It means timing of places and people and things to get the right person at the right place at the right time. God's got a cupbearer that hasn't even been kicked out of the palace yet. But he's going to be there one day. And I need you to be there when he comes out. Because I'm going to use that to get you into the palace and under Pharaoh. The process it's a combination of time and development arrangement of people and circumstances it's a it is a combination of our personal refinement there are things in us that God has to purify and get out of us sometimes it's arrogance sometimes it's that level of pride or jealousy or something that God sees in you that he knows that he can't work with when he gets you where he's taking you. I can guarantee you there's a very good, well I say guarantee, there's a very high likelihood that when Joseph 
got where he was going. Everything he had been through made him appreciate where God brought him. If you only knew what I'd been through, you know why I appreciate where I'm at. You see, tonight, there are other pastors that I know that have done everything in their power to climb the ladder of pastoral success. In their eye, pastoral success means pastoring a bigger church, having a larger salary, being set with no difficulties or as few as possible. But you see, I don't look at pastoring that way. I was more like, look, if you knew the times that I pastored little storefront churches, pastored in my front living room of my house pastored the homeless community in the streets and the woods of Apopka if you knew where I came from you'd know why that I appreciate where I'm at and I've been here for almost 12 years while other pastors during that same 12 have hopped to here to there to there to get a bigger church I'm not interested in a bigger church I'm thankful for where God brought me from I'm going to tell you, we would do good to be thankful because the process is often a personal refinement that we don't realize. Sometimes that is a combination also of our personal readiness. You realize that there are times that God could put you in position, but you're not ready. If he puts you in there now, you'll mess it all up. If I take you straight to the palace right now with your youthful attitude, you're going to mess it all up. If I put you in that position today, you'll mess it all up. There are things that right now that if the devil had his way, that if he could push you in, a, in the wrong direction, he'd have your marriage hijacked and messed up and mess up your potential for ministry and everything else. But God says, son, that process that you go through, there are many times that that process is about getting you ready for your own personal readiness for where I'm taking you to. I thank God for everything I went through even though I didn't feel that way in my flesh then because it made me a better pastor today. Every time I was sick, every time I was in the hospital, every time I thought I might could die, Every time I went through personal struggles of my own, it made me a better pastor. Because when somebody else walked through the door, it allowed me to have a level of compassion I couldn't have otherwise. Somebody say the process. It is the process. This is what the Holy Ghost gave me on this process. Sometimes it is a combination of specific individuals being affected during the process. I'm going to elaborate on this a little bit more but by the time I'm done. And it's the most powerful part, I feel, of the whole entire message. But I'll just scathe over the top right here. God will bring people in and out of your process. Never discount anyone that comes in or out of that process because many times the process is for them for that season. He used Joseph to help a cupbearer understand his fate to be restored to the palace. Sometimes God will allow people to come in and out of your process that he will affect. I'm going to touch on that a little bit more in just a minute, but I want you to see this. We can allow the process to make us better or bitter we can cause the process to take longer than it should. How many of you remember the Israelites? Forty years of wandering around in the wilderness. Do you remember where in the Word of God the Lord spoke to them and said, You've come past this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. You've been here in this process long enough. It's time to come out. It was not the will of God, I don't believe, for them to be stuck in the process. But they made the process take longer than it should to get to the land of Canaan because of their griping and their complaining and their turning their backs and their hearts from God and turning it towards other things and looking back from where they came from, saying silly things like, would to God we could go back to Egypt where we at least had the onion and garlic and we knew what we were going to eat the next day and what it, when it was going to be. 
they cause our process to take much longer than it should have. And I want to preach this to you. You can also forfeit. And as a pastor, this is one of the saddest and most heartbreaking things that I've seen people that had a call on their life to do something for God. You can forfeit the process when you give up during it or when you quit trying and you quit hoping when you become bitter towards God because of the process or when you become bitter towards the people that God strategically put in your lives to help see you through it. I've watched people get so angry with the people that God has strategically placed in their life, so mad at the ones around them, so bitter. They build walls and nobody can get to them and the person God put in your life or the people God put in your life to better you, to help you, to get to where He's taking you They can't help you because you built too many walls. But I want to share this. This is probably the most important thing of all, at least I feel tonight, because this spoke to me. How many wants God to talk to him tonight? Many times what God is doing with you is not about you. I want to say that again. Many times what God is doing with you is not about you. Sometimes it feels that way. It feels like God's punishing us. God, it feels like you're you're, you're whipping me. You're putting me through unnecessary stuff. But many times what God is doing, He's using your prison to touch somebody else's life. We don't always see that during the process, do we? Pastor, make it real to us. Well, this is what the Lord began to show me. It is through some people's suffering and continuing to keep faith in God, the family and relatives. Sometimes they come to God when they see that you're struggling so bad that yet you keep faith. I don't know if I'll ever forget this. Sister Shanna, who you hear Sister Wendy talk about a lot because they were so close. She was such a trooper for the Lord. She had a lot of life, a lot of excitement, a lot of energy, and a lot to offer. She was right, like a right-hand man, if you will, for Sister Wendy. They sang, they worshipped, they traveled all over the place, and they affected and touched the lives of many, many people. When Sister Shanna was there, she would light up the room. She had so much zeal and energy. Well, all the way up to the end, she had developed cancer tumor, if I'm not mistaken, in her throat. I'd have to ask Sister Wendy again for the details, but if my memory serves me right, it had developed in her throat. A period of time went by. They prayed through the process. They sought God through the process. But guess what? It was God's lot to take Sister Shanna on home in the end. But I'll never forget, by God's grace, One day I was looking through Facebook, and there was a video on there. Here laid a video, uh, laid a woman in this video who's dying. She's at death's doorstep. She's on her way out. Her mouth is so dry, you can see the corners of her mouth. Sick. She had gone down, lost a lot of weight. And as she laid there in that bed, She began to sing songs, hymns, worshiping God as she laid there. And I want to tell you something. I don't know if I've ever shared this with Sister Wendy. I think I have. But that video did something to me. I looked at that, and Brother Josh, I said, if that woman can lay there dying, singing on her way out, rejoicing and worshiping God on her way out, and here I am with these little nitpickety problems that I got, and I'm complaining and all of that, I began to have greater faith, and I began to say, God, if that woman right there can do it, thank God any of us can. Somebody say amen. I read a story many years ago when I had long been saved. I don't know why I felt the need to tell this tonight. 
but I hadn't long been saved. And I want to say it was Fox's Book of Martyrs or a book similar to that. And in this particular story, if I can get it exactly correct, in this particular story, they were getting ready. This was a real thing that had been recorded in history that happened. But they were getting ready to martyr a group of people that professed to be Christians. And what they were doing, they would take them and bring them up into a courtyard where that all the townspeople could see them being burned at stake. There were stories that were written about this in articles through history where that they would pour tar all over their bodies and then light them on fire and let them burn through the night. And they would martyr them and take their life like that. Well, as they began to gather, they began to talk amongst themselves. And the story said that one of the people said, I'll go first. They were one of the ones that were going to be one of the first ones to be set on fire. And so they said, one person told the rest, said, I'm going to go out there. And when they set me on fire, said, I'll let you know when I raise my hand, I'll let you know if it's bearable and if God's with me in the fire. Well, the story went on and they said that they led that man out there to the courtyard they poured tar all over his body while he stood out there in the public eye they set him on fire while some of the other ones that were waiting for their turn to come up there stood that man strapped to that pole covered with tar set on fire burning in the night and the story said that as that man burned they began to stand there and they began to get nervous because not yet had they seen the man's hand go up they said they watched as the fire burned his body his skin began to drip off like it was candle wax until his bones were exposed on his hand and said all of a sudden when you thought that it couldn't get any worse he threw his hand up with that bony hand with no skin or flesh on it as if to say I've gone all the way and he's right here in the fire with me let me tell you it might be a process but every life that touched by what you go through God has a plan for them somebody say amen you see through every it's, it's through final break up or breakthrough at the end of a chapter that God receives recognition when even sinners say who but God do you know what a testimony it was to the God that had favored Joseph when everybody saw what he went through, and yet somehow he went from a pit to a prison, and from a prison to a palace. Who but God? Do you know there are people that if you'll stay faithful, especially your children and your family, I know what my daddy went through. I know how my mama used to be. I know my mama used to get her drugs from the dope man. And I know how much of an alcoholic my daddy was. and I know how my family used to be. What a testimony of the power of God when they see the process and they see God bring you through it. I began to pray over the last day or two and I said God I haven't understood much of what I've been going through but if it leads my family to the Lord or somebody's life gets touched Lord eternity's a long way off God if this is your lot and plan for me I surrender to the plan of God whatever God has planned for me and you know I began to look at this in a different way it would change our perspective to God if I end up in jail. Every inmate becomes part of that process and a potential for me to touch their life. I had one brother begin to testify who had gone through cancer treatments. And he said, Pastor Myers, every time that I went into that hospital, every doctor and every nurse, every doctor and nurse become a new platform in the process. What if God allowed you to get a sickness because he's got a doctor in a hospital somewhere that you're going to win to the Lord? What if there's a family member that's been running from the calling, but somewhere in the process you get touched, they get saved, and they go on to do God's will? What if? You see, 
Some of you may not realize this, but we have people that we sit amongst every Sunday morning, those of you that are here regularly, that have gone through processes and are a product of somebody else going through a process. I can't tell the story the way that he would tell the story, but Brother David Mobley, who we recognize for working with our children's ministry. Brother David's daughter, Jessica, was in the driveway one day playing with some fireworks. One of them went off and hit her in the eye, took her eye, damaged her eye. Through the process, going to hospitals, calling out to God, Brother David and Sister Rhonda came to know the Lord, and to this day, they have affected the lives of countless little children because somebody else's process. What I'm telling you is is that sometimes we can become selfish in the process. And we look at our situation and say, it's painful for me. I don't understand why for me. But somehow, if we could start changing our perspective and say, God, If I'm in this hospital, am I supposed to be talking to somebody? God, if I'm laying in this hospital bed, the next nurse comes, is that the one? Is that who it is? Because every new dimension of the process is a brand new platform for you to reach somebody you may have never reached before. Brother Roy, this may sound crazy, but God may say, I'm giving you a new dimension of work. You're going to start your own company and you're going to hire somebody that you're going to win to the Lord. What if God said the transition? I'm just making something up. I just out of nowhere but what if God said there's a new dimension that I'm taking you to and you say God I didn't want another job I didn't want to quit I had security where I was at I knew I was going to get a check every week for a certain amount but God says there's something bigger than you because sometimes uh, what God is doing with you is not about you it's about somebody else God's going to reach somebody else through what he's doing. God's going to help somebody else. If I end up in the hospital, every nurse, if I end up in the courtroom, every attorney, everybody that I come in contact with, a brand new platform on another dimension, every prisoner that he got in contact with in that prison, he was a man of faith. He was a man that loved God. The favor of God was on his life. i got to wonder to myself how many people that he affected their life as a prison guard and a prisoner himself i got to wonder how many people were touched by his process. You see, sometimes whenever we realize that it's not about us and it's sometimes about other people, it makes it a little easier to understand the process. You see, the pain of our prison often has a way of blurring our vision of the place where God's taken us. The palace. Sometimes it's hard to see when our vision is blurred by the prison of circumstance. Sometimes it's hard to see beyond the walls of the prison. And if that don't make things better, when you get so ill, so irritated, that when people that have a good word from God come along to try to encourage you, you will not hear it. Know this. You can either make it through the process or you can die in the process. I have in the last few days had to think about my own life. I've had to talk to other people that were going through a death-dying process. And when you take all it into a summary and calculate it all up, I would come away and I would say this. If I knew that I could die in the process or that my life would be over when it was all over, you know what I think I'd want to do? I'd want to make as much difference on my way out as I could. You can allow this thing to get a hold of you and devastate you and destroy your mental ability to process anything. Or you can stand up and you can say, God, I'm beginning to realize now that all of this may not have been punishment after all. Maybe you've been refining me, getting things out of me for where you're taking me. 
before a couple can get married and stay true and faithful to the commitments of vows, sometimes God has to get things out of them so the marriage doesn't end in divorce. Sometimes there are parts of our life that God is still working with as part of that process. Stand to your feet all across the house tonight. I realize tonight that the things that I have shared with you will not make you just skip along across the clouds of your process. It will not always make you want to shout in the middle of a prison or a difficult season. But I feel like God's given us a little bit something to think about tonight about the whole of the process. Have you ever been in a place where you just didn't understand why things were happening the way they were? Have you ever been one of those people that said, God, I've tried to be good to you. I don't understand. This doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I've been trying to put my best foot forward. <clears throat> it seems like the harder I try, the more I get knocked back. Well, guess what? You wouldn't be the first one, and you probably won't be the last. But you know what separates those that make it to the palace and those that die in the prison? People that say, I'm not going to give up on what I know God has purposed and planned for my life. What I'm telling you is this. If God spoke to you and said, I'm going to make you a preacher's wife. I'm just making things up. But if God spoke that to you and you know in your heart, don't let a prison season convince you anything otherwise because that's just part of the process of how God's going to get you there. When God lays it in your heart and tells you anything or reveals anything to you, stand on it. Because there will be times that you're sitting 13 years long and you're wondering, why is this whole thing taking so long? I thought God was going to do a great thing. Do you realize it was about approximately 22 years from the time that God told him what he was going to do to the time that it unfolded. That's a long time. That's a lot of years and days and months to wonder why. That's a lot of sleepless nights rolling and tossing and turning in the bed saying, God, why? That's a lot of days of staring into space and thinking, is there something wrong with me? Am I not even saved? Does God not love me? I want to tell you, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about tonight because you've either gone through it or you're going through it tonight. God didn't send me here for no reason with this message. There are people that God wants to help. I want to open up this altar tonight and give you an opportunity to be able to get down on your face before God and to be able to have, be able to have a one-on-one -on -one talk with the Lord and say, God, I realize tonight some of my perceptions about what I've been going through may not have been accurate. I realize tonight you may be just trying to help somebody else through what I'm going through right now. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed across this church, if the Lord has spoke to your heart tonight and He's begun to deal with you specifically, you know exactly what it is. There are things that have been said tonight that have, were spot on with what you've been going through, things maybe you've even said. I want to challenge you tonight to step out by faith and meet God in the altar tonight and talk to the Lord about what it is that you have been battling. Sometimes you say, I don't know why I try. I try to get help, but it seems like I just can't break through. God has a timing and a place, but you've got to stay true and faithful. You can't give up during the process. You can't throw in the towel and you can't say, God, I quit during the process. Just like Joseph, there were times that it seemed like things were going great. Just whenever Joseph had been elevated and taken on the position under Potiphar, he was placed in control over many, many of the slaves that were in that day. He was given position, and it seemed like everything was going well for him, only to have the rug snatched right out from underneath.